ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, I'm going to be uh, giving you this first lecture, which will also involve some discussion. Um, and the topic is theory of communication. Um, for some people this might be very easy, for other people it might be very difficult. I have no idea. Uh, I suggest that you take notes, because uh, I will say a lot of things that are not on the slides. <coughs> And I'm not sure you will get the slides. So, take notes. I know some of you are not used to note taking, but it's a good habit. Are you going to have it online? No. Oh, you mean the actual oral presentation? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah, that, uh, yes. That I'm uh, more comfortable with. <laughs> but you should still take notes, you know. Come in, come in. Okay, so the topic is theory of communication. And what will we be studying then in this course? A number. A number of influential works. And by extension, very often, of course, they are authors uh, that you should really be acquainted with as part of your uh, education in communication. So, as you will see, it might seem that communication is a fairly new subject, new topic. In some sense, it is. In some sense, it is not, as you will soon discover. So that's what we're going to talk about. So let, let us first just discuss what should be included in a theory of communication. The word communication comes from the Latin verb communicare or communicat, and which means to share, communicate, or impart. So actually, the original meaning would allow such things as sharing a drink, sharing a loaf of bread, etc. It doesn't have to be information. It could be more concrete material things that you're sharing. Okay. So, and this in turn comes from the Latin adjective then communis, which is also the same, which is behind words like community. You know, gathering people who do something together. So it's all about cooperating, sharing, doing things together. That's a very basic idea behind communication. <coughs> so making something common or shared locally, like you do in a face-to-face -face conversation. You're sharing information for a period of time, <coughs> let's say. Could be a very short, one minute, could be several hours. <coughs> so that's the beginning. The, the term communication is actually not so old. Well, of course, it depends on your perspective. It's about 500, or 500 years old. Maybe some of you think it's old. But uh, it's not that old, actually, when it comes to language. So it's from the uh, 15th century. And, and there, it still meant sharing in general. And it's only in the 19th century, the 1800s, that it starts to mean what it means today, sharing of information. Okay, so it's a fairly new, new concept, new development. If we look at the academic discipline of communication, it's even newer. Okay? So there were no university educations in communication until the year 1947, which is exactly 60 seven years ago. <laughs> Very good. I could hear somebody say, you down there. Yeah, I, I like this date. You, you what? I, I can't forget this date, that's why. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, 
Okay, and at that, in that year, the Institute for Communications Research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign was started by Wilbur Schramm. Okay, <coughs> now we come to one of the problems. Did people not study communication in the sense of sharing information before 1947? Yes, of course they did. But they studied it under other names. Okay, so one of the common names they studied it under was the word speech. So in the United States there were many departments of speech, or sometimes of English. Linguistics. No, linguistics is different, we'll come to that. Linguistics is more abstract in some ways. And it deals more exclusively with language. Communication is in some sense broader. Uh, Irrespective of terminology, the topic of communication has long has a long tradition of description and there has been a series of things which have to do with communication for more than 2,000 years. Okay, so that's where we're going to start. A long time ago. More than 2,000 years. So now, as I said, we're going to have some discussion. So I want you to turn to your neighbor mm -hmm. where you're sitting and think about in which academic disciplines do we find studies of communication today. Now, if you're alone, you turn to the people behind you. Okay, let's hear a few of your answers. Who wants to start? Yeah? Political science. Political science, yes. In fact, I was at a symposium only two weeks ago where they were studying the importance of gestures and facial expressions in political science. So that's certainly one of the places you find studies of communication. Yeah, anything else? Yeah? Anthropology? Yes, there are lots of studies of communication in anthropology. There is, you know, the ethnography of communication, the anthropology of communication. I agree. Yeah? Yeah? Psychology? Lots of studies of communication in psychology. Do you have an example? Otherwise, I can give you one. <laughs> <They're all outside. laughs> you know, for example, therapeutic communication. You know, what are you doing there when you're lying on your couch and the psychologist is asking you about your grandmother or mother or whatever? <laughs> right. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. We have a life uh, example of the education, sharing information. Process. Education, right? Education lives by communication. Well, how else would you be educated if not by communication? So it's a basic instrument. Yeah, yeah. Linguistics. Linguistics, of course. It's the basis for linguistics, too. I mean, that's the basis for language. Yeah. Marketing, management, PR. Marketing, yeah, what is marketing? Special kind of communication. Yeah, actually, communication. Yeah, I'm sure. Right? Media in general. Yeah, yeah, media lives on communication. Right? Philosophy. Philosophy, yes, but, but okay, philosophy is not just communication, right? It can, there is a philosophy of communication which is very important. I agree. But, you know, there are other things in philosophy, too. Yeah. As there are in psychology, of course. I mean, so some of these things you intersect. You don't have a total identity. And some of them, like marketing, that is communication, <laughs> so to speak. But some of them, you have more of an intersection. Yeah? Um, advertising? Yeah, sure. That's a kind of communication, you might say. It's like marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, somebody who's not spoken, you're not spoken. Uh, telecommunication. I can't hear you. Telecommunication. Telecommunication. I even have the word there, so <laughs> no doubt. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Sociology. Sociology. Yeah. And that, it's like psychology and philosophy. There's an intersection. Very important sociology communication. Yeah. Public relations. That's you might say is communication again. Special kind of communication. Yeah. Medicine, yeah, like, like social psychology, there is a special intersection between communication and medicine in several different ways. Yeah? Journalism. Journalism. Journalism is a kind of communication again. So, <laughs> so we have this, there, there are some of these topics that are kind, special kinds of communication. Other, where we see there is an intersection between two disciplines. Yeah? Human resources. Yeah, that's also very largely speaking communication, not perhaps totally, but a lot of communication there. Yes? Yes? IT. Huh? IT. IT, yeah, it has a lot to do. Of course, there's a hardware aspect too, which is maybe a little different, but yeah, sure. Software is a lot to do with communication. Yeah, so, yeah? Biology? 
Again, like psychology, etc., there is an intersection. Biology, the biological basis for communication is extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. Conflict resolution. Yeah. Now we get into a special uh, type of communication again. Conflict resolution. Yeah. Are you noticing what you're giving me now? <laughs> you notice what this is? Yeah, it's sharing, but it's also giving you a lot of hints for what kind of jobs you could get after you finished your education. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, okay. Very good. We'll see my list now. It's not as long as yours. Did I have anything on my list that, yeah, business studies, That's the, but some of you mentioned marketing and so on. But otherwise, it's the, like your list was longer than mine. So uh, we will be uh, concerned with the subject matter of communication irrespective of academic discipline, okay? What we're going to study is not, in this course, is not going to be labeled communication necessarily. It could be labeled something else, as you will notice. So we're going to be, this course is largely about historical influences. Okay, so we're going to start far back. We're going to start in antiquity and go forwards. Uh, and we're going to notice that some of these theories that were formulated a long time ago still are okay to use and to think about. They have not become old-fashioned and out of date. And that is, you know, something that this field has in common with perhaps something like philosophy and so on. I mean, in some fields you would say, I don't know if you take the uh, I don't know, astronomy of antiquity, it's not so, perhaps so up to date today. It's not a field that you would turn to automatically to get more insight. But in communication, philosophy, a few other things, still some of the things that people thought of a long time ago could still have an influence today. That's going to be, in, in our field, it's going to be a true about rhetoric. Okay? You've all heard of rhetoric, I think. We'll, we'll come to that. Uh, as we go along, we're going to look at, talk about both theory and description. So what's the difference between theory and description? Well, description, I say, for example, this chair is red. Some kind of red. Everybody see this is a description, this chair is red. If I want a theory, I need to explain why the chair is red. Who wants to explain why the chair is red? This chair is red, and I say, why? <laughs> yeah, do you have an explanation? Well, that's the color they chose. So. That's not a very good theory. <laughs> that's the color they chose. <laughs> I want to, what do you want to say? Um, because that's what we can tell. Louder. You can talk that that color is being red. So. Is that why it is red? Why? Because we've been taught it's red. Well, that's a very, what shall I call it, sociologistic yeah. theory of color perception. <laughs> <laughs> we have, yeah. We have to go in details. Like it has a rather red color to describe it more. Yeah, like the optical ray, the optical. Uh, information reaching our eyes and how we transform it in our brains, etc. etc. It's a fairly complicated theory, right? I mean, but there is also, as you said, there's a social component. We have learned. There's a social component, there's a biological component, there's a psychological component, there's a physical component. Okay, so it's, it's actually very complicated. But what, all I want to do now is to put your mind to this idea that there is description and there is explanation. And if we have both, we have a theory. If we only have description, we don't have a theory. We need also to be able to ask the question, why? We need to have some explanations for what we're looking at. Okay, some of these theories that we're going to study in communication are normative. They don't tell us about what people are doing and why they are doing what they're doing. Instead, they tell us about what people should be doing. Okay, so if you go to something like marketing, probably they're going to teach you how you should do your marketing campaign. They're not, usually people who go to that sort of uh, education, they're not so interested in what people actually do. 
They might be interested in that, but that would include all sorts of mistakes that they're doing in marketing, etc. That's what people actually do. Rather, they're interested in a theory of what should be done. Now, that's often the case in communication, that people want to know what they should do, rather than what they actually do. So let's say we had a course here on public speaking, and some of the people came up and they would, you know, I don't know, dance around, or they would stammer, or they would do... So if we had a theory of what people actually do when they communicate, that would, you know, that would be the second one here. That would be a descript descriptive, factual theory. That's different from what you should do. Okay, so that distinction is going to come back again and again. The theory of what we actually do versus the theory on what we should do. Okay, normative, what we should do, descriptive, what we actually do. Now I'm going to put you to work again. Try to think of some theorists or theorists that you think should be included in a historically based account of theories of communication. So this will test your own knowledge of what you are aware of in this area, and then you will see what I'm going to present you with. Okay. Uh, it's going to be interesting to compare your list with the list I have. So let's see what names you've got. Yeah? Well, I think one of the first was Socrates. He was Socrates? Uh, even, even though he didn't actually call himself that he was working in the field of communication, I think he did. Yeah? And uh, we can uh, try to remember what you said and we'll see if they're on my list later. Okay, Socrates, yes? Um, I think uh, Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco, yes. Italian semiotician, yes. Aristotle. Aristotle. We tried to. Uh, I will come to Aristotle. He is, I can reveal already, he is big on the list. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Yeah? So, sir? Saussure, Ferdinand de Saussure, yes, uh, very important person in modern linguistics. Yeah, uh, yes. Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault, yes. French uh, theory of I, what do you call it? History of ideas. Shannon, Claude Shannon, yes, he's going to be big. Very good. Yeah. Oh, Marx, very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Descartes. Descartes. When why Descartes on communication? We're thinking about communication. Because I read now. it in the book. I'm going to ask you later. <laughs> I'm not aware of Descartes was big on communication. No, it was I, he, he was mentioned in one of the chapters. Yeah, so but he didn't a, really yes. write about communication. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. Norman Fairclough. Norman Fairclough, yes. Is a critical discourse analysis? Yeah? Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is like Karl Marx. He could be relevant anyway. <laughs> yeah? Anyone else? Yeah? Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann. Yeah? And the sociology of communication, you might say. Yes? 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 Kurt Hofstede. Yes? Big in intercultural communication, yeah? Uh, Bourdieu. Well, Pierre Bourdieu, social, uh, social linguistics, that sort of thing, social language, yes? Uh, Any more names? No? Okay, now we'll, uh, we'll see what I have. Uh, let us first notice that uh, Socrates is not on the list. But Aristotle is. And I'll come to why Socrates is not on the list. Uh, let me see any of the other names. Fulton is somewhere on the list. Yes, he's there. And uh, Shannon is there. Uh, Bourdieu is not there, but he, maybe he should be there. Uh, Walter Lippmann is not there, but maybe he should be there. <laughs> uh, who else were the names? Uh, which one? Uh, the Italian guy. Umberto Eco is there somewhere. Yeah? Anybody else? Uh, 
Karl Marx. Karl Marx is only there indirectly. <laughs> Sigmund Freud is only there indirectly. <laughs> yeah. Martin Luther King. He's more a he's not a theorist of communication. <laughs> he used you know his knowledge of rhetoric for a good purpose. Okay, now but okay, so you see that uh, this has a lot of names that were not the, among the ones you mentioned, and you mentioned some names that are not on the list. So we'll see what we can do about that. Okay. <clears throat> Could I ask something about the critical position? Critical, yeah, but not today. Okay. Today we're only going to do uh, the first, the top half here. We'll come to that uh, next time. Then we'll talk about it. But you can ask now too if you want to. We'll uh, about the, the person who belongs in... Uh, you want to know who belongs to the critical tradition? Like Habermas? Yes, he sometimes, yes. No, he's not so strong at the critical, he's more general theoretician, I think. But if you take Horkheimer, Adorno, Adorno, yeah, the Frankfurt School, and then, you know... Frege. Frege. Frege, Paolo Frege. Oh, Paolo Frege, yes, yes, yes. Not Dr. Frege, no, no. <laughs> right. Yeah, Frege, sure, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we, can, we can, as we go along here, I have not made a list which includes everyone. So if you want me to talk a little extra about someone, just mention them. Chances are I'll know something about the people. <laughs> I'm, I'm open to uh, deviating a little from my course. Can it I ask a have question? To... Huh? Yes? Uh, do, the, do the writers can be like in this communication system as well? For example, Terry Pratchett? For example, who? Terry Pratchett? Terry Pratchett? <coughs> Terry Pratchett? Yes, for, he was like, you know, who had this, you know, theological degree. For example, or Tolkien as well. Because Tolkien. Yes, because. Oh, these are authors. Yes. Yeah, but, but they are more like they they're this. like Martin Luther King. They practice the theory. Practice. Okay. They're not really theoreticians, I would say. Okay. They, I mean, Tolkien is a difficult case because he was really professor also of Old English, right? So yes. he knew. He, he knew a lot about Old English and he could use that in his writing. Yes, and he had this, yeah. you know, Elvish So there could be some intermediate cases. <laughs> okay. I agree. Yeah? <coughs> there is some Arabic to the like Ibn Khaldun. Very good, Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. I can admit right from the start, I have left mostly the non Europeans out of this. And that we could maybe make a special session on non European con contributions. So Ibn Khaldun, and you know, there are many actually uh, Indian, Arabic, and Chinese that uh, should be included, which are not included right now. But we could include. If you, uh, feel, if you feel strongly about this, I am willing to try to do an extra. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So let's start now in Old Greece. And we're gonna start with the sophists. Why did people in Old Greek, Greece and now we're talking 500 years before the birth of Christ, right? So, 2,500 years ago. Why did they start to teach communication? Well, because in Greece they had invented a kind of special way of taking people to court. Court, you know, if you had done something bad, if you were a thief or if you had murdered or whatever, then you will be taken to court and you will be sentenced. And the special thing about Greece is that they did not have just one, the king or somebody who sat down, but they had a group of people who were the judges. And these judges had to be convinced by good arguments if you wanted to be free. So, because some of, and, and Greece was divided in many small city-states, who were not friends always, but, and so on. But anyway, in these, some of these city-states, especially Athens, they had these courts of law, and you had to be very good at arguing in order to go free. This meant that there was an interest in many people in learning how to argue in a good way so you could go free if you were in a court of law. So some people started to learn how this should be done. They are the sophists. Okay, That's the origin. 
That's why you started to teach communication. To be free in a court of law. Okay, after a while, people noticed that some of these states were also democracies, not all of them, but some of them were democracies, and you could vote to make political decisions, and some of them noticed that, that here, also, it was very good to know how to communicate and to argue. <coughs> so the same teachers who were teaching people about how to, what to do in a court of law also started to teach them how to win political argument, argumentation, how to give good speeches, rhetoric started to come. Okay, so that's the, that's the origin. And then there are some people who were like specially marked out, who had, you know, more interesting things to say than the others. And their names we have here. Well, we have some of their names. I mean, there were other people too. And in general, these people who were teaching how to argue, they were wandering, they were walking between the different Greek cities and so they were like, uh, yeah, they were wandering teachers of communication, you might say. <coughs> so, three of the most well-known of these are Protagoras, Gorgias, and Isocrates. Protagoras is uh, remembered for a few different things. One thing is, he had a problem with how, how should he describe debating. I mean, we're talking about the beginning now, and there are not necessarily words in the language for what you're trying to teach. So what does he do? He tries to think of something which, according to his mind, is similar to debating. And he comes up with the word wrestling. So he thinks of debating as a kind of wrestling match. And so, he uses a metaphor, the technique of heuristics. And heuristics actually means wrestling, okay? <coughs> But, but he is using it in a metaphorical sense. I mean, this is very often the way in which new words come up. You use them metaphorically and they get a new meaning. So, heuristics is the old Greek term for intellectual debate. But it's a metaphor from wrestling. And he started to think about how should I teach people what to do? So, you have to classify what you do when you talk. So, one of the things you can do is you can make assertions. It is raining, that's an assertion. You can ask questions, you can say, is it raining? It's a question. Or you can say, close the door, that's a command. <laughs> okay, so these are the classical three. Assertion, question, and command. And he had them in his, what he was teaching, and plus some more. He's also remembered for having formulated the homo mensura sentence. Have you, who has heard about this before? It's very central to uh, Western, at least, humanistic thinking. And, and uh, usually it's given, man is the measure of all things. That means that we human beings cannot really think independently of ourselves. What we think is important, what we think is small or little, it comes from, we're not, we don't have an absolute view of the world. We're all, we're in a sense, impre imprisoned in our own nature. So, man is the measure of all things, of things which are what they are, and of things which are not what they are not. That's very, that's a fa famous um, sentence, which uh, actually is the first sentence in uh, a book that Protagoras wrote. And we're talking 500 years before Christ, okay. Gorgias is another sophist. Uh, he, uh, he also taught people what to do, and he was one of the first people to insist on teaching people to memorize. So they, they, he would teach them how to have a good opening of a speech, how to close the speech, how to evoke the feelings of the audience, etc. And he did this by having people memorizing the things to do. Huh? Without looking at Without looking, yeah, by heart. Demonstrating by heart or memorizing it. And then uh, reproducing it. So he, he used that. Isocrates, he is the first, he's the founder of the first professional <coughs> public school. If I remember correctly, the school existed for 50 years. Um, and he. Uh, 
in a sense, went outside of the idea that you can memorize everything. He insisted actually on the opposite, in a sense. He says it's not enough to just memorize things. Every occasion has some new features, and you have to be flexible in what you see, what you say. You have to look at the people, you have to see how they react, and you may have to change what you had planned to say if you see that people are not reacting in the way you were expected. Okay, this is in rhetoric, this is called kairos. That means to contextually adapt what you have to say to the situation. Very important in communication studies. We'll come back to that again. The context is something that many, many, many people have rediscovered and rediscovered and rediscovered. And here's like one of the first uh, people who noticed that. E. Socrates, not Socrates. E. Socrates. It's <laughs> a little I first there. Okay. <clears throat> now we come to Socrates. Andafia. E. Socrates. Who's, who's Greek here? You're Greek? I could hear the pronunciation that. E. Socrates. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. For <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you can correct me here if I'm wrong about what I'm saying here about the, the wrestling match. And all. <laughs> So it's good, it's good that we have so many people from different parts of the world. So if I say something <coughs> stupid, you can say, no, it's not like that. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> and here we have Plato, yeah, Plato in English. Platon, perhaps, in Greece. Platon. <coughs> Platon. And nobody really knows what he looks like. So you find many different pictures of him. <laughs> and uh, well, he uh, actually Platon is not his real name. His real name is some Aristo something. And uh, Platon is just the name he got because he, he was a good wrestler. Actually, <laughs> he was broad. And uh, anyway, he had a, he was teaching philosophy in a place in Athens, <coughs> which in English is called the Academy. In Greek. Academia, which means um, a grove of trees, okay, and uh, he was teaching philosophy there. So academy, like academic, that's where the word comes from, okay, his, his teaching in a grove of trees in Athens. Uh, and he had a hero, he wrote almost 30 dialogues between his hero and other people. And his hero was called Socrates in English and in Greek. Socrates. Socrates. Okay. <laughs> That's where. So nobody really knows what Socrates actually said and did. Because Plato filtered you know, what we know about Socrates. That's why I didn't mention Socrates as, a, as an independent uh, person. Yeah. But he, of course, he, everybody thinks he exists and that he had very important ideas. So. Okay, so here's what Plato, through Socrates, some of the things he did. First of all, he did not like the sophists. He did not like these people who were teaching people how to communicate. And he thought that they were teaching people how to persuade other people using any means. So, for example, Socrates thought that they would often flatter their audience. You say, you who are so smart, you who understand everything, you will understand that what I'm saying is correct. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So Socrates and Plato did not like that at all. So he claimed that what they were teaching was flattery and trickery. And what Socrates, Plato wanted was to argue correctly, to try to find truth not try to flatter and persuade people by means which did not lead to truth. Yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, I just have a question. Was he referring to Platon, like one of the rhetoric Like We're not there yet. No, no, I mean, it's we'll come there. When, yeah. when Aristotle comes along, we'll talk about Platon. No, my question is, did he not like this? No, he did not like that. He did not like evoking feelings. The only feeling that you should evoke is understanding, you know, understanding of the world as it is. He, he, he argues that that's the best way to persuade people. You should not try to make them uh, happy or afraid or something like that. You should just 
yeah, try to present things in a clear way so you understand. <coughs> okay. Um, and he also wrote, he, as I said, he wrote, he wrote almost uh, 30 dialogues. And, uh, well, he touches on many topics which have to do with language and communication. One of the topics is what, what is sometimes called naturalism versus conventionalism. Is language something that comes from nature, or is it something that human beings have invented? Okay, that was a topic that they debated. And he presents in this dialogue, Kratilos. In English, often Kratilos, because they use the Latin form. Uh, he presents the arguments. So he says, you know, there's one character who says that it's all, all words are just, uh, they're different in different languages. And, uh, you know, you could call, this could be called, uh, I don't know, chair. It could be called uh, stool in Swedish. And, you know, here's some other language you get. So it's all conventional. And the other side says, no, there are natural connections between language words and nature. So I'm just going to give you some of the arguments because, I mean, the conventionalist position is the one that most people have. So the other position is more difficult to defend. And here are some of the arguments. So he says, if you say, this clearly comes from, uh, you know, copying some sort of motion, <laughs> rolling, okay? Then he says, if you say, ee, this clearly comes from a natural tendency to say ee when you have something small. <laughs> I'm not saying this is correct, I'm just telling you what, what he says. <laughs> okay. And then if you say f or ps or s, these are most appro appropriate for imitating blowing or hard breathing. Yeah. That sounds correct. Okay, so it goes on like this, and it tries to find you know, various arguments for why there's a natural connection between language and what, what the words are about. This, this debate has continued into our days, in, not exactly in this form, but in, in other forms. For example, it has to do with, do we have genetic predispositions for language, or is it only learned? You know, there are some linguists who think we have a strong genetic, Noam <coughs> Chomsky thinks we have a strong genetic predisposition for language. Other linguists think, no, it's not very strong. That, that's a version of this debate. Okay, I won't say any more about Plato. Now I come to Aristotle. Now he was a student of Plato's. He was also in the Platonic Academy. And he is in Greek called Aristoteles, maybe. Aristoteles. Aristoteles. Thank you. <laughs> we have to have the stress on the uh, pen on pen ultimate syllable, right? <laughs> Aristoteles. Yeah. And again, we nobody nobody really knows what he looks like, so you get different pictures. <clears throat> Okay, he, Aristotle, ha, he lives a little later now. So he has heard the arguments of the Sophists. He's heard Plato, Socrates arguing against the Sophists and so on. So he, he thinks it's now time to try to summarize, bring it all together and see, you know, what can we say about rhetoric? And now people have already been teaching rhetoric for a hundred years or so, okay? So he's, he's uh, we're now in the middle of the 300s. So, so we, we, we're going for some time here. And uh, so he, he uh, then, he says, there are two, when it comes to arguing, and they're, they're thinking a lot about arguing still, arguing politically in, uh, in the courts of law, etc. He says, there are two special cases of communication. Or one, two things that you have to think about when you think about how you should communicate. So. One is, what is a good argument that leads to truth? That's the Socrates Plato favorite, right? The other one is, how do you convince or persuade other people in public speaking? That's the sophist, that's the rhetoric tradition. So these two are put against each other by Aristotle. They were already put against each other by, by Plato and Socrates when they debated against the sophists. But he, in his work, tries to summarize both positions. 
and to provide some kind of account of, yeah, of both ideas. Okay, and here are some of the concepts that he introduced which are still used by people. First one is syllogism. Who has heard of syllogism? Nobody. So if I say all Greeks are happy, Socrates is a Greek, what follows? Socrates is happy. Yes, right. So that's using the word all and the form of the verb be. All Greeks are happy to, I mean, you could just say all A's are B's, X is an A, therefore X is a B. So if you formalize this in law, that's all that's going on. That's one of the syllogisms, maybe the most classical one. Syllogismos. Syllogismos. Yes. Yes. So that's what it is. These are patterns of reasoning, patterns of argumentation that are valid because of the meaning of the words all, some, not, be. Okay? And there are between 10 and 15 such patterns. I'm not going to teach them to you now, <laughs> but they are there. Topoi is another concept. And this, this is uh, when you are arguing with another person or you're writing, and this is very useful actually if you're also in written argumentation, if you're writing a scientific paper or a paper for this course or something. These are places where you can find good arguments. So topos means just place. And uh, topoi is the plural, and uh, in Latin it's locus. So uh, sometimes the Greek word topos is exchanged when people write about this with the Latin word locus. Um, so these are places where you can find arguments. Okay, so if you are uh, arguing with somebody and I say to somebody here like you, you are a racist, and then you say, no, can you define racist? What are you doing then? You're using the topos of definition. See that over there? So, you know, whenever anybody says anything to you, you can always pick up one of the words and say, what do you mean? <laughs> Give me a definition of that word. <laughs> That's a very good place to look. To generate the uh, argument? Yeah. It's a, you, know, you, you can yourself present the definition to win an argument, but you can also ask another person to give you a definition. Mm -hmm. So it, it can work in both ways. Okay? Or evaluation. Is this good or bad? <coughs> Cause or effect? Why is it happening? What will the consequences be? These are typical things that you will find in all scientific papers and in most kinds of argumentation too. There, th this is not an exhaustive list. I think there are, I don't remember, but there are, there are more, top point, 10 maybe, that he mentioned. <coughs> then, he had another, categories. These are ways in which you can describe something by a predication. So, you can say, uh, you, what's your name? Cecilia. Cecilia is a woman. Then I'm giving substance, woman. Cecilia is one person. That's quantity. Cecilia is very nice. That's quality. <laughs> Cecilia is close to me. That's relation. <laughs> Cecilia is sitting here. That's place. Cecilia is sitting here now. That's time. Cecilia is sitting. That's position. <coughs> and state Cecilia is fairly happy. <laughs> here, there you go. So that, these are all, okay, actually Cecilia is not doing anything, that's a negative action. <laughs> and Cecilia is influencing me in some way. <laughs> okay, so these are, again, you notice what he's trying to do? He's trying to tell you how you can write, how you can describe, how you can explain. This is like a general theory of what you can do when you're communicating. This is not old-fashioned. I and mean, there are people who write about this today who are much worse. Much worse. <laughs> this is pretty good. Uh, another thing he was interested in is practical syllogisms. Not just, you know, all Greeks are happy, Socrates is a Greek, Socrates is happy, but he wants to know how can we argue to how we should act. If I want to buy a car, let's say we have two people, 
One person thinks it's a good thing to buy a new car every second year. Another person says, don't buy new cars, always buy second, so, you know, second-hand cars that are old. It's going to be much more economically. How can they argue so that they can come to the right action? <coughs> that is something that Aristotle was interested in. How can we reason to come to a decision about what to do? Okay, that's practical syllogism. And the last concept I'm going to mention to you is empty means. These are people, or things that people often believe in, but which are not, not necessarily logically true. So it's, it's a way of reasoning that people will usually agree to, but it's not based on a good logical argument. So uh, that's it. Let's meet tomorrow morning at uh, 7 o'clock. And you say, why? I want to sleep. And then I say, well, you know, early bird catches the worm. <laughs> you understand? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is a, that, means, that means like uh, it's always good to do stuff early in the morning. Yes, yes. You know, in many other languages, uh, there are different ways. In Swedish, we say, uh, the morning hour has gold in its mouth. In the, are there any Germans here? Morgenstund hat gold in Mund. <laughs> yeah, it's almost the same as Swedish, right? So there are many ways to, okay. But that's, as, as you can all see, this is not a logical argument. But, you know, you just bring up something that a lot of people believe in, and maybe you'll be su successful. Yeah? I've got a question. Um, in the enthymems, do um, superstitious beliefs fall into that as well? Yes. If they are successful in convincing people. Yeah, so <coughs> prejudice. You know, lot, all that, if you can use it to convince somebody else, that that's, can go under anything. But it, the, the idea is here, it's something which is convincing, but it's not logically correct. So, it's a pretty good catalog of things that you should think about when you're uh, entering in, into organization. Okay, maybe we should have a small pause. Yes? yes. <coughs> So 10 minutes for and we start again. Start again. So we're talking about uh, Aristotle. <coughs> I have a little more to say about him. Actually, you know, that I, there's a lot I'm not saying about Aristotle, today, but I'm saying at least one more thing. So one important thing that when you're thinking about communication is to think about um, what functions can communication have, especially if you're giving a speech? And Aristotle came up with this uh, three functions, which uh, still many people talk about and use. Uh, he called them logos, ethos, pathos, and whatever it is in Greek, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe logos. Logos, logos, ethos, ethos, and uh, pathos. Pathos. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, logos is not so surprising. Means the uh, logical structure of what you're saying. You know how you put it together. What it, the facts that you're talking about, etc. So logic. Basically, when you syllogisms and so on and all this stuff, this is uh, relevant for logos. Ethos means whether people trust you or not. If you seem to be the kind of person that you can believe in, you can trust what they are saying, building up credibility. That's the main function of ethos. So trust is the key word there, credibility. And that, when you're giving a public speech, it's very important to be trusted. If people don't trust you, like there was a, a president in the United States, Richard Nixon, and people at an early stage gave him the name Tricky Dick. <laughs> and they would have an uh, announcement where it says, would you trust this man to buy a car from? You know, things like that. Not so good for Richard Nixon. <laughs> people obviously did not really trust him. So that, that was, he had not been able to build up strong ethos. Uh, and that's 
yeah, that's a very key thing to, to do whenever you get, I mean, in many circumstances, but especially in public speaking. Pathos is the emotions and feelings, etc., attitudes that you can evoke in your audience. So you might say that trust is a special example of that, but it's a specially important example. But other examples, such as the audience becoming very um, happy, enthusiastic, or they could become very afraid. These kinds of feelings that you're trying to raise in your audience, that is pathos. But it's not primarily the speaker's own feelings. They can, your feelings as you're talking can be used to raise the other person's feelings. It's the other person's feelings which is the target here. Pathos. So logos, ethos, pathos. Remember these three. They are, you know, they are often used when people talk about communication. Now we leave Aristotle and we go quickly forward here, 300 years. We come to Mr. Quintilian. Quintilianos. And now we leave in Greece and we're going to Rome. Okay. He had a, um, a school of rhetoric. Uh, we'll talk about. So he, uh, so 300 years have passed since Aristotle. And there have been new developments. So Quintilian did more or less the same thing as Aristotle. He summarized what had happened since the last summary, so to speak, which was uh, like 350 years before him. It's a long period, 350 years. So he, he now comes in and he writes, uh, as you can see, a 12-volume textbook on rhetoric. Institutio Oratoria. Now, we'll, you know, this is not Greek, this is Latin. So now you're or orator. This means to be a public speaker. So in this book, you find like the second big summary made in, in antiquity. And this one is in much more detail than Aristotle. Therefore, also more boring to read, perhaps. <laughs> a lot of details. But it's very complete. Okay, one of the things that he has become famous for is his summary of five important parts of speech making, stages of speech making. A lot of people know about this. For some reason, it's sometimes called five canons. It's not a good word, because that can mean many things. I would prefer to call it parts or sta stages or something like that. The first uh, part is that you have to think of something to say. So inventio. So he, he discusses, if, let's say uh, I give you an assignment, for tomorrow write me a speech. So you come home and you sit there, hmm? what should I write about? <laughs> I don't know what to write about. <laughs> so then you can look up uh, Quintilian and he'll tell you what you should do if you're in this situation. So that's inventio. So what you okay? So in, in this, you probably have to use a lot of logos. Not me, not always, perhaps, but uh, very often you have to think about. You know, there has to be something that you want to discuss, something that you want to present, etc. Okay. Once you come up with what you want to write about, you have some idea about the topic, etc. Then time comes to plan more in detail how the whole thing should be structured. This is called dispositio, okay? And he then shows the various parts of dispositio. So, the first part uh, of any talk should be the ex ordium. That's where you build the confidence of the audience. Okay? You sort of make them trust you. That's the first thing you should do in public speech, according to this idea. I mean, you could have another idea yourself, but that's what he suggests. Then you should give some story, what you're talking about. And then there are various ways of supporting this. Partitio, confirmatio. Confirmatio means, you know, providing, confirming evidence. How about being <laughs> okay, uh, so 
there are these exordio, narratio, partitio, confirmatio, conclusio, that means that when you come to the end, you summarize, you give your conclusions. Now, there are many words for this. One word is arrangement, but you, know, you understand the planning, the structure of the whole thing. First you come up with an idea, then you structure what you're going to say. Makes sense. Okay, once you have this, you should start to work a little on uh, yeah, how, how you should express this. You maybe start to write different parts of it, and uh, you know, you come up with, you should use some metaphors, what style you should use in general. And he gives a lot, here is where he actually has a lot of detail, and he tells you about various things you could do when you give speeches. <coughs> and now, number four, is something that uh, was absolutely necessary in antiquity, but uh, is not always practiced today. That is, you had to memorize the whole speech before you gave it. So you had to, you know, know everything you were going to say by heart. Could not cheat like I am doing now. You know? I have these slides here, which provides support for my memory, but that was not allowed. You had to learn the whole thing and then pr produce it from memory. So they had a lot of discussion about how one could memorize things. And uh, there, was, there were several different techniques. The most well-known one is called the house. Anybody heard about that? No? Well, you've heard about the house. Yeah. Tell me about the house. Well, it's a kind of memory building where you put uh, out the different parts in the exactly. in, in a building. So imagine a house where you have an entrance hall, you have a kitchen, you have a dining room. In each room, you put some argument. Yeah, remember we take short courses the next time. Don't stay away so long. One more. Okay, so that's the uh, memory theory. And the last thing is you work on the fine details. Uh, how you pronounce things, what gestures you should use, all this. So they, they did not neglect the fact that communication is multimodal, that you, that you use gestures and talk together. All of this was sort of nicely summarized in these five points. <laughs> Still used today. Anybody taken a course in rhetoric? No? Not yeah? yet. You have. Do you recognize what I'm saying? Well, I don't really remember. I remember all the things. It's a long time ago since you took it. But faintly, so that goes. <laughs> okay. But at least in Sweden, uh, in America too. I, I've been teaching in America too. Uh, these words are still used. <clears throat> okay, now we leave antiquity and we take, no, not completely. We'll have one more little thing here. Now we, we're going to leave rhetoric and come into something called semiotics. Semiotics. Okay, this is, uh, well, you might say it's a lot of thinking and theorizing around the idea of a sign, of a carrier of information. Okay. And there were theories about carriers of information, about signs already in antiquity. And if you read, for example, Plato, Aristotle, etc., they have things to say about signs. But perhaps the most well-developed theory was uh, developed by a, one of the schools of philosophy called the Stoics. They got that name because they used to meet in the Stoa. Which is perhaps a Greek word still today? Uh, yeah, it's, it means like a cave or something that is uh, uh, not underground, but it's covered. From yeah, the but actually in those days it was <coughs> the part of the central meeting square in Athens. No, it means the opposite. Yeah, but in those days that's what they met in the specific, specific place on that uh, central square, the store. Yeah, anyway, they got their name from that, like the uh, people in Plato's Academy, that was a you know, place really from the beginning, where there were some trees, and this was a place where, uh, perhaps it was covered so they could stand there on the rain. Maybe that's why it's called Stoa, I don't know. 
I think it was covered actually. That it was along uh, with pillars on each side where they could walk and they could talk. Okay, they had a what I'm going to call a three-place relation. So if you have a sign, take a word. A word is a sign. If we take the word chair, chair, what's your first language? Russian. Huh? Russian. Russian. This in Russian is called stol, right? Stol. Stol? <laughs> 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 huh? Which dialect do you speak? <laughs> okay, well, I'll ask you about that later. <laughs> yeah, anyway, you say stool. Yeah. Okay, stool. Okay, fine. It's like Swedish. Stool, Russian and Swedish have the same word, but it's, in English it's called chair. So we have the sound, chair, stool. Okay, now, now we have the meaning. What is the meaning? Is this the meaning? The object? The chair itself? Well, some people say yes. Then we have, if we had that, we had the word itself, the signifier, the chair, stall, stool, or then the thing that this signifies, the reference, and that they call the tukanon. Okay, they had seminal tukanon. And now, now, what is this then? The third thing, the first thing there on that list. Well, let's say you're lying in your bed and you hear the word chair and maybe you imagine something maybe you have a little picture of a chair, maybe something else that's what they, we, you can, if you like, call it a concept or a word meaning okay, that's something else than the chair, right? because the chair isn't there, you're lying in your bed, you're just seeing this, okay? so that's the three places, they have a concept, they have a word, they have a reference this word can obviously differ between languages but the meaning might be more or less the same in Russian and Swedish and English. More or less. I mean, it's not... No, that, that's actually... Turns out it's a little more complicated, but... At least as far as objects of that sort, then it's more or less the same. I didn't get it. Huh? I didn't get it. Louder? I mean, I didn't get it. Can you, like, explain it more? You don't get the three-place theory? No, but I get it. What's chair. your first language? Arabic. Arabic. Uh -huh. What's chair in Arabic? Kursi. Kursi. Okay, so kursi, is that this? It is. Okay, so the word signifier seminon is kursi. Okay. This is the reference, the two canon, if you use their terminology. But what you think about when you lie there in your bed, that's the concept. Like a king, Think about sitting in it, like when you I could be sitting. yeah, you could be sitting in it, or just think about it without sitting. <laughs> you just think about a chair. You, you know, you, you, you hear the word chair in English. It's not just the sound. If you hear e, that's just the sound. The chair has something more, a meaning. That's the, the first thing on the list, the concept. That might be more or less the same in Arabic and English. You with me now? Yeah. yeah. That. Okay, so notice that we have three components here. We have the external carrier, the sound, we have the internal meaning, and we have the thing in the world. So to speak. Okay. Yeah? Sorry, what happens with abstract words like love and feelings? Yes, a very good question. What happens? Answer the question. We have love, so we have a sound. We have a we concept. Have word, we have the concept and what do we have in the world? Complicated. <laughs> Very complicated. This, that kind of question, that's a good question, is the kind of questions which we have to deal with when we do semantics. You know, semantics is one of the fundamental parts of linguistics. Semantics and pragmatics. That creates problems for a simple model of this time. <laughs> This, this model is fine for chair, not so good for love, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. So with this, we get to the medieval period. We jump now, a thousand years almost. <laughs> okay, so we're up in the 1400s. We jump from, uh, yeah, uh, more than a thousand years. 
And in that time in Europe, there are people in the monasteries who are rediscovering all the uh, philosophy and thinking of uh, antiquity. One of the most well-known people to think about signs and language and so on is this person, Occam. See him there? Uh, he was a nominalist. Now, in, in those days, they debated very much the nature of universals. What are universals? Well, they are words like horse or chair, for that matter. And the question is, when we think of the meaning of the word chair, what are we thinking of? Or the meaning of the word horse? If you follow Plato and Socrates, and I didn't tell you about this, they say you're thinking about some abstract thing in the world of ideas, which is the same for Arabic and English, etc. The abstract chair or the abstract force. If you follow more the Aristotle line of thinking, they say it's something mental. We have a kind of mental idea of a chair or a horse. <coughs> if you follow Occam, he says, you don't need those things. It's enough to just have the word with its sort of slightly unclear meaning. So he wanted not... You, the people who believe that there is an abstract thing, they think that abstract things are real. So they're called realists. The people who believe there's a mental concept, they're usually called conceptualists. And the people who think it's enough to have just the word, the name, Nominalists, na namelists, so to speak. That's Occam. And he formulated a very well known principle called Occam's Razor. So he cut away the abstract ideas, he cut away the mental ideas, and he just had language. He did this also for some other problems. <laughs> so what it says there is Entia non sunt multiplicanda preter necessitatem. Non est ponenda pluralitas sine necessitate. These are two alternative formulations of the same thing. They're not, they're, it's not one, one thing, it's, it's two, two synonymous ways of saying the same thing. And what it means is, don't assume more than necessary. And this one says, don't multiply the entities more than is necessary. This says, don't assume a bigger plurality than without necessity. So, you know, and his cutting away of these in favor of this is an example of his own razor. And in science, simplicity is often an ideal. And people will talk, we'll use Occam's razor. Cut away. We don't need these assumptions. Make it as simple as possible. <coughs> The medieval period actually was quite rich in linguistics and in communication science. And one of the interesting ideas was the idea of modi significandi, the modes of signifying. <coughs> so they had an idea that language reflected our thinking, and our thinking reflects the world. And the way they understood that is to say that uh, our world can be analyzed in the way Aristotle analyzed it, because they believed still in Aristotle. More than a thousand years after the death of Aristotle, they were still believing in that. And then they, they would say that, okay, if we think of the world that way, there are things in the world, there are processes in the world, there are properties in the world, etc. That is reflected in our thinking of the world, and it's also reflected in our language. So if we take nouns, what kind of things do nouns in language usually signify? The objects. Objects. Things. If we take verbs, run, jump, what kind of things do verbs usually signify? Actions. Actions. If we take Adjectives, yellow, big, small, Describe. properties, properties. So they go on like this, okay? So they say that, okay, all of these things, things, <coughs> actions, properties, they are 
categories in Aristotle's idea of what, how the world is organized. So that, that there you see, and, and the whole pr approach is called speculative grammar, and it means mirroring grammar. So what is mirrored here? Well, the mind mirrors the world, and the language mirrors the mind. Reflection. Huh? Reflects. Reflection. Reflects, yes. So speculum means mirror in Latin. So it's not, and from this, people later on who could not really understand what they were doing, they would say they are speculating, <laughs> and that it meant the modern meaning, which means you know, just thinking about things maybe not always in a clear way, but actually from the beginning it meant to mirror. Okay, they did. They had a lot of different kinds of. Uh, interesting types of analysis. One of these is the analysis of suppositio. And again, now we find another way again of talking about words in context. <coughs> they noticed that words do not always have the same meaning. It depends on context what they mean. And this is one of the ways of formulating such a theory. Okay, so if we take the word car, we can say Car is spelled, the word car is spelled with three letters, C-A-R. What does the word car refer to in that sentence? The object defined. Itself, as a word, right? It's not the object defined. It refers to itself as a word. Car is, you know, the object <coughs> on the street are not spelled with three letters. They have four wheels. <laughs> It's, it's actually the word itself, the right thing word, right? If you use it in that sense, you're using the word, suppositio means stand for. You're using the word to stand for itself in its own word matter. So they call this suppositio materialis. And it's a little confusing the first time you hear it, you think it might be a matter in the world, but it's not. It's the, mat the word itself as a matter. Okay, now if you think about a car, we have no cars in this room, but we can all imagine cars. These imagined cars, if we think, my car is red, and I think of my car, actually happens to be red, uh, then the word stands for my mental image. This they call suppositio mentalis. Not so strange to understand that, so it means that the word is standing for something mental. But if the word is actually about the object itself, you stand you say, you point. You point to the car. My car, this car is red. Then you're using it the way the words, according to them, formally should be used. And therefore they call that suppositio formale. These, these are the terms they themselves use. And, uh, when you hear them the first time, they're not so easy maybe to get immediately. You know, why do they call when you talk about words and you mean the objects that they stand for, why do they call that formalis? Not immediately evident. But that's what they call it. But I think you understand the idea. The idea is to, to be aware that words do not always mean the same thing. Depends on context what they mean. You all look slightly worried. <laughs> this, this means that we've come to the most difficult part of today's lecture. <laughs> I don't know. Who understands this? Anybody? It sounds the same as the subject. Here, somebody understands it to 60, 70 percent. I think that's, that's good. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, this semiotics has been rediscovered again and again in history and also the influence of context as we'll see you know that's been rediscovered and thought about in different ways one of the persons who sort of recently discovered it was not so far after the medieval period this guy called john locke who was uh, uh, an english philosopher who is mostly famous for writing about political science and so on but he also was interested in the power of language when it's used in politics which is all, you know, not a new interest, it's still going on today. <laughs> so in 
So, and he is actually the person who can be credited with the term semiotics. Like we talked about the term communication when we started today. We can also talk about the term semiotics. And that's the term that John Locke invented. Study of science. The picture of John Locke down there. Now, we will jump 200 years up. So we'll get to the 1800s. Now we get to maybe the greatest uh, modern theoretician of semiotics. This is the American philosopher Charles Sanders <coughs> Peirce. Anybody ever heard of him? Nope. You have? Good. He's, he's maybe America's, yeah, perhaps most well-known and best philosopher ever. He is generally regarded as the founder of pragmatism. He's still a very popular philosopher with many people. Pragmatism, yeah. Okay, let's look at some of his ideas. First says, and notice the spelling and the pronunciation. When you see that spelling, you would might think that it should be pronounced peers, but it should not be it's pronounced purse. Uh, he says, there are only three ways to carry and represent information. And as far as I know, this is still true. There are no other ways. Okay, the first one is index. That is representation by contiguity, that means closeness, and actually by some extension, uh, first believe in, in, in an analysis of causality, cause and effect, which says that cause and effect are always united by temporal and spatial contiguity. He got that analysis from David Hume, who was a British philosopher. <coughs> and so, this is the, the, the beginning of this idea is this the I think it's called index because of the index finger. So if I point <coughs> this, my finger is here, it's pointing that direction, it's pointing to the computer. So the index finger is carrying information about the computer. Okay? But in the same way, if we extend this to causality, if we see a rain cloud on the sky in the sky, that rain cloud is connected with a possible effect, namely rain. Okay? Cause and effect. Also, contiguity, closeness, and time and space. So, the rain cloud could be said to be an index of rain. Or if I'm talking and I blush, my blushing could be an index of my being tired or being shy or something like that. So all of these things are causal processes based on causality. They're all indices, index. Okay? The second type is similarity based. Or if you want to speak more technically, homomorphism, isomorphism in the perfect case. So this is a picture. If you have a picture of something, that of course is, if you have a picture of the car, it represents the car. And it represents the car by similarity. That's not the same thing as causality or index. Okay, and the third thing is symbol. If I say that the word chair represents this object, it's not because chair is similar to this object. Could be called something else. There's no similarity relation. It's not an icon. It's not because this object somehow by contiguity causes chair. According to this analysis, chair is only associated with this object because of a social convention. People speak, speaking English have for some reason agreed that this kind of thing could be called chair. Okay, so these are the three ways you can carry information. By contiguity, closeness, similarity, or arbitrary convention. Okay, this is important. 
This is surely one of the things you're going to hear again and again. This is one of the main theoretical insights. There aren't really any other ways to carry information. <coughs> These three types of representation are not mutually exclusive. So you don't have to be only an index or only an icon or only a symbol. They can be combined. You can have an indexical icon. You can have a, uh, I don't know, iconic symbol. So let's take a case of that. Um, you are, some of you are aware of the Christian way of painting saints and holy people. They're called icons, you know this? Who, who knows about this? Some people, you've seen these pictures of saints in churches? Okay, that's the Greek word, it means picture. Icon. Okay, so here it has a specialized meaning, meaning holy people in churches. Okay. Now if you look at the faces of these people and how they are picturing whoever they are painting, you can see that they're fairly similar. They're not, they don't paint them in any old way. I mean, they're painting in a sort of standard, standard fashion, especially if you go back a few hundred years. They all look fairly similar. So you can see that there's a kind of social convention combined with the similarity. Okay? They are similar to that person, but they're similar in a way which is shaped by social convention. So here you would see a combination of icon and symbol. Symbolic icon, you might call it. You with me? You understand what I'm saying now when I'm talking about they're not mutually exclusive, they can be combined. Or, let's put it, take another example. Let's say that I'm your friend, you're coming into the room, I feel happy, so I smile. Then my smile would be an index of my happiness. It's a causal process leading to a smile. However, that day I'm a little tired, and I know that smiles are signs of happiness. So I put on a little extra in my smile. Actually now I am mimicking, I am imitating a smile a little. So I'm, I'm putting my smile a little stronger. <laughs> okay. Now what is happening? I'm combining what? Index and icon. Okay, because now there's a natural process which is the basis, but I'm building on it with a little more similarity-based stuff here. Do you get a, see what I'm saying here? So these are three ways of, of fundamental analytical dimensions in how you can carry information, but they can be combined. This, you will have, if one of the exercises in the lab will be on this. We want to make sure you understand this. This is one of the you know, theoretical dimensions here. Okay, and the last thing there, index is a fundamental physical aspect of icon and symbol. Well, most things can really only be conveyed by, uh, for example, if you have sound, you have to have acoustic signals or you have to have optical waves, etc. These are all physical processes. So if you're looking at a picture, it's similar to something. That's similarity. It's an icon. But the information is carried to you through optical waves. That's index. Okay? So index is often a fundamental aspect behind both icon and symbol. Okay, I understand that this is a little abstract. This is now you got to the second point today, which is a little abstract. The first was supposition, and now you get to these types of representing information. <coughs> okay, maybe you don't need this exercise, or do you need it? Yeah, yeah, yeah actually we do it in a different way. Can anybody come up with another example of a combination? Or maybe, no, I'll give you a few minutes to put this fairly important. Talk to each other, and that's the last thing we'll do before the break. <laughs> so, anybody who has some combination example? Yes? Okay, um, our example is a rose. A rose? A rose is a symbol for love. Yes. And also the icon, because if you have a picture of a rose, you can either say it's a symbol of love, or you should see the icon to the real rose in the garden. Is it a picture or a yeah, real rose? Yeah, you have a picture. Yeah. No, a, a picture of a rose, and the icon okay. of the real and rose. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's the real rose, it's not a picture. Yeah. No, but it could still be a symbol. Then it will be an indexical symbol. Okay. 
Yeah? I have a question. Is it that, um, can you say that a rose is a symbol for love? Is it like a, because we learned last time that it's a convention that we invented? You want symbol and yeah, that's what the definition is of symbol. Yeah, like that. Uh, symbol that is agree. conventionally agreed. Yeah, means but that. But that's the symbol. Huh? I wouldn't say that rose is a symbol. Well, not, not well, you think it's more than convention that rose is a sign of love? It could, but it could also be something else. Well, if it's something more, if there's a deep connection between roses and love, if there's a causal connection, then it's an index of love. As soon as you go down to natural processes, causal processes, you could move from symbol to index. It might be that it's a combination of a natural tendency to think that, you know, love and roses go together. In that case, it could be indexical symbol, having some of both. I mean, it's not, it's not impossible to combine them, as I said, yeah? Anything else? Any other examples? Yeah? Here, um, red lights in the street. Yes. So, um, basically, the red light would be an eye when the, the index for stopping. Index of stopping, like when you but see it's red. primarily a symbol, probably, <laughs> meaning stop. Mm -hmm. Then that symbol leads to people to stop, and then there is a causal effect of the symbol. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's like secondarily an index, but primarily a symbol. Yeah. Oh, okay, but under okay, but there's another. Maybe you were thinking of the fact that we see the red light. And that means that you yeah, that means it's also indexical in that sense. Yeah. And also, it's, well, it's simple because we agree. Yeah. yeah. So actually, the, the index aspect will come up twice, both as a carrier of the simple stop, and yeah. then in the effect. That, that's how. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I paint something. Yes. Uh, like you can say an umbrella. Yes. And then I take a picture of it. Yes. On Instagram. Very good. It's an icon of an icon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you paint the umbrella, that's an icon, you're painting. Yes. Then you take a picture of the painting, that's yeah. an icon of an icon. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfectly possible. I mean, we, you can have symbols of symbols, icons of icons, you can have symbols of icons, all these comments, they, they don't only have to be combined together like this, they can be, you know, on top of each other also. Yeah. What about if I point at you as index? Yes. Uh, could it be like index of communication or linguistics? It could be because of the you know the like professor of linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You'd be pointing to a representative of linguistics. Come on, yes, yes. Most of the science can be considered as a combination of. Yeah, yeah. For example, it's very over the door. Yes, you're right. This is very good. This is actually a combination of symbol and icon. And index. Very. This is actually a good one because it's placed here. Notice. Points here. That's the index. This. This. What is this? This must be a symbol. It's not. You know. It's not, arrow me, it's somehow a symbol. It's not. This is an icon of some kind, but it's very stylized, so it's like an iconic symbol. <laughs> or symbolic icon. So to say this one is more it's a good one. To analyze, I think. It has all the elements in it. Very good. Uh, I want to finish this. First, also, like uh, the Stoics, first had a two value uh, analysis of science. No, three value, sorry. So this is very close to what we were talking about before. He, he talks about uh, signifier, the word car, <coughs> the, the voice, the, the sound. Then there's a mental representation, which he, he calls the interpretant, because that's how you're interpreting whatever you're hearing or seeing. And then there's the car itself. So again, this is like the Stoics, and Peirce, in a sense, reinvents it. I want to do... I don't know if we should do this. Maybe we shouldn't. No. You want to? Can you take one more thing and then we take a pause? Yes. Sure. Yeah. 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 Sure. I'll make it slightly. Here is a guy called Charles Morris, and he uh, 
trying to build on PERS and some other people and make uh, semiotics a more um, systematic kind of science. And he, um, well, he, he, he summarized some of his ideas in this way. He said that any semiotic system, system of science, can be studied from three <coughs> perspectives. If you only study the relation between the signs, the signifiers, the sounds, etc., with characters on a page, then you're studying syntax. That's the relation between signifier and signifier. That's syntax. If you're interested in the relationship between those signifiers and whatever they are signifying, signifying their meaning, then you're studying semantics. If you're interested in not only the relation between signifiers and whatever they mean, but also how the whole thing is used in context, then you're studying pragmatics. These, this suggestion for how to use the word syntax, semantics, and pragmatics have become extremely popular, and almost everyone uses it. Aren't you major in mathematics? Yes, I have. You've been looking up what I've done. I can <laughs> You're right. Very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. <laughs> yeah, so that, remember these, these two words. Syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. And now I'll do the last thing before we go for a little break. I'm going to take, introduce this guy, Fernand de Saussure. So one of you mentioned him. He was a Swiss, French, French-speaking Swiss person who lectured mostly in Paris. And he uh, was very important for modern linguistics. As you can see, he lived between 1857 and 1913, so now we're getting to the 1900s. After the break, we'll get more into the 1900s. <coughs> so, in contrast to Peirce and the Stoics, Saussure, for some reason, did not have a three-valued sign concept. He only had a two-valued sign concept. So he only talked about the sounds, and the psychological meaning. I'm not sure why that was so. One reason is maybe he didn't know about Peirce, and he probably did not know about Peirce, and he did not know about the Stoics. And he also suggested another name for this discipline, another name than the one Locke had suggested. Locke had suggested semiotics, which is the name we mostly use when we study science. But he suggested instead that it should be called semiology. And actually, in French, do we have any French speakers here? Yeah, it's sometimes called semiology. What it, you are, you're French, right? You're not French, you're French speaking. I'm not Canadian. You're Canadian. From the French you, part. From the French part. Oh. What do you call it? Semiology. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so you're using Saussure's suggestion. But I know in French it can also be called semiotique, but it's uh, maybe an anglicism in some sense. I'm not sure. I mean, because semiotics was actually quite old. It goes back also to almost medieval, but not. Okay, and Saussure was very much uh, convinced that language was only symbolic. And he talked a lot about the arbitrary signs of language. Arbitrary, not totally arbitrary, they're governed by convention, but when he speaks about arbitrariness, he actually means that they're governed only by convention. And for him, there were some problems that he had to discuss because there, were, there, there seemed to be some counterexamples. For example, if you think about what a dog says, whoa, 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 or bow, wow, wow, or where's the Russian speaker here, gaff, gaff, gaff. <laughs> Yeah. So in all these cases, it has some similarity with what a dog says. Some similarity, but you can see that it's a combination of icon and symbol. So it's an iconic symbol. 
And he called that something else. He called it onomatopoeia. Okay. But he discusses this a lot because it's a counter, counter example to the idea that language is only symbolic. <coughs> so Sear also introduced some dichotomies which have been uh, quite influential. One dichotomy he used is the distinction between log and parole. Okay, he was, uh, so Sir liked the metaphor <coughs> of a chess game when he thought about language. So in chess, you have the actual rules of the game, but you know you can play with different characters. They can be made of plastic, they can be made of wood, they can be made of stone, etc. And each game is a little different. If you're only interested in the rules, and not in any particular games or how the, what, the, what the pieces are made of, then you're interested in long, in the set of rules for language. If you're interested in the particular games, the particular uses, then you're interested in parole. So in English, this is something sometimes called language and speech. And, and, and according to Saussure, uh, linguists should only be interested in long, not parole. Only in the rules, not in the... And this was very influential for a long time. But in the last 20 years, people have more and more gone against this. They said it was oversimplified and we have to be interested in parole a lot more. Okay, <coughs> he ha also made another distinction between the synchronic and the diachronic study of language. So synchronic means that you study language at a given point in time. Diachronic means that you study change in language. So we, for example, we started today by talking about how the word communication has changed its meaning. From meaning sharing in general to sharing of information. That's a diachronic point of view. If we had skipped all the history, we would have been synchron. <coughs> okay, syn is at the same time, so to speak, with the same time, dia. At least two going. And the last thing I'll say before the break is that semiotics has continued to be of interest for many people. And I'm mentioning two names here which have, which have been uh, a lot of people have liked to read. One of them is Umberto Eco, Italian. He's also an author. And maybe some of you have read The Name of the Rose. Anybody have read The Name of the Rose? No, never? Have you heard of it? Maybe? It's a hard book. What? Try to read it. You, you, think, it's, you think it's a hard book? And I think it's boring at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was very amusing. <laughs> Maybe I'm deformed by my subject. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he's a, he's a well known character and he's uh, still active. Um, Michael Halliday is another guy. We'll come back to him in more detail. Social semiotics. He's also still alive and he's active in Australia. Now we take a break and we come back again in uh, 15 minutes. Uh,